Right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining Build First India session number five. Uh, today we have a very special guest, uh, Dr. Alan Benton. He's a trained physicist with a doctorate in high energy physics. He has spent a great deal of time in undergrad and graduate courses, participating in teaching and outreach activities. He went on to teach math and physics at Taipei American School. He joined Team 4253 as a mentor and the Computer Science and Robotics de uh, Department under the chair and 4253 lead mentor, Matt Fagan. His primary role in mentoring 4253 is a focus on continuously improving both their programming skills and outreach activities. As a teacher, he teaches courses in both project-based robotics, various computer science courses covering high-performance computing, neural networks, and quantum computing, and a mentoring program in which high school students mentor lower school students for an in-house LEGO robotics competition. We're so excited to have him with us today. Doctor, please, over to you. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for the, that introduction. Um, so let me, just, uh, let me just go ahead and share my screen first. Um, essentially, I, I, had a, I had a tough time thinking about exactly how I should be uh, presenting this because um, as I started going through all of the stuff in 4253's past, um, it became very kind of a little bit of nostalgia and kind of interesting, very quickly realizing that it was uh, fairly difficult to um, essentially cover everything that I would like to cover. Um, so essentially what I, what I want to do um, is, is kind of give you, you guys a bunch of, um, you all a bunch of talking points for people that you uh, want, to, want to reach, um, especially considering it sounds like, you know, India is currently budding as a, um, as a first, or as a, a first community or an FRC community. Um, I would like to give you first a few skills or a few um, things that you can use to, to help encourage that. Um, after that, I wanted to then talk about just exactly our experience in, um, in Taipei American School and also in uh, our team 4253. Um, and then finally, uh, for, the, for those of you who have had experience in FRC, I'll give you a few pointers on things that you can kind of do to help maintain uh, your momentum. And as well as for the new students or for the new teams, uh, it would be uh, some a few things that I can kind of give you as a as a primer to what you want to think about starting with um, next year. Um, another thing is that we, because we're, I'm in Taiwan or our team is in Taiwan, we have very unique challenges uh, corresponding with um, Taiwan in general. And I, they may or may not be, uh, they may not may not translate to what you have. So if there's any questions uh, about what I have to present or if there's any relevance or irrelevance, um, to what the, the challenges or that you face, or maybe they're not challenges at all, please let me know um, so that I can help focus exactly what my, my, my talk is going to, is going to be on. Um, so let me, just, let me just go ahead and, and start. So um, here's, the, here's essentially the overview. Um, I just wanted to talk very briefly about project-based learning. I know I'm preaching to the choir because all of you are uh, all of you are in FRC or want to be in FRC, so project-based learning is clearly something that you want to do, um, but I want to give you just a little bit more of a feeling or things that you can say to encourage others to also join this, uh, join this bandwagon. Um, I also want to talk about the extracurricular activities and their impact on students, um, and that's essentially what FRC is, it's in extracurricular activities in project-based learning. Um, and then I'm going to go on and talk about, you know, FRC at the school, um, FRC in Taiwan, our challenges and solutions, sustainability, and then what you want to do. So kind of things that I have already said. Um, and again, if there's, if there's any questions, I know there's a few chat boxes that, that pop up, um, but please interrupt me audibly because I, my, my experience with Zoom is somewhat limited, not entirely. Um, but feel free to ask any questions uh, while I go through this, you know, go through this, uh, this tirade of, of uh, robotics at TAS, and um, and that will that'll also help me guide what you find interesting or what you uh, what is super important for you for all of you. Okay, so let me first start talking about project-based learning. Um, one of my favorite teaching strategies, and also the most um, challenging of the of, of teaching strategies. So, project-based learning and robotics. Um, essentially allows, it allows a student to be more responsible for their own education, 
while allowing them to work on something they actually care about and that they're actually interested without forcing them to learn various different parts of things that they don't necessarily uh, find as interesting. Um, and even it also allows them to, to work on things that they originally didn't think they found interesting, but then find a use for and making it finding interesting in the first place. Um, so, you know, in this context, it gives them different aspects to explore different STEM topics. And you can explore a whole bunch of different uh, concepts just with robotics in general, and that's in physics, engineering, um, and mathematics. These are a bunch of projects that we did in our, at our school over the past semester. Um, they were a ton of fun, student, or most of them are over the past semester. Um, they were a ton of fun. Lots of students get lots of engagement with them. Um, one of our most famous things across all of our divisions, the upper, lower, and middle school, um, is our couch robot, where essentially a, a, a couple of students put a couch on a drivetrain um, and programmed it. We have another um, project in which a bunch of students made a balance bot. Um, another project in which a, a couple of students wanted to make a, a giant kicking machine um, in which they explored the use of pneumatics as well as a drivetrain um, and, and the ideas of linkages and such like this. Um, some more simplistic linkages was a, a prototype for our climb last year, um, which is this, uh, this double bar or four bar linkage. Um, students sometimes are interested in skateboards, um, and so we end up uh, creating like an electric skateboard. Let me just mute that. Um, and then finally, for those of you, for those of the students who are not so interested in um, uh, in construction or fabrication, we have a lot of programming opportunities as well. Um, where this is a kind of the, the state of the art of our programming team, where we have uh, where we use OpenCV to follow a target um, on, our, on our competition robot. Um, and so another, another reason why robotics is useful for, for project-based learning, um, it draws on students' past experiences, things that they've played with before in their past, in their childhood. Um, you learn about technology fundamentals by creation. Um, they also understand why it's necessary to stay current because the technology keeps changing over and over and over again. It allows you to teach students how to um, basically understand that you always have to keep up to date with technology and finally it's fun every single one of these projects are uh, projects that students have created and chosen on their own and so you get a lot more engagement um, from students who actually were actually the ones that decided the, on their projects in the first place so this is a reason why you know these are these are things that you can you can take away and why project-based learning is really important um, as a teaching mechanism and um, can be more impactful towards students, especially with students that don't necessarily engage as well um, with traditional traditional classroom teaching. Um, okay, so the impact of extracurricular robotics, I'm gonna bore you with a few studies that I found over the past few days. Um, all of them are just through the FIRST website. If you want to um, take a look at these yourself, um, you can simply go to the FIRST resources and, just, and look through either a bunch of presentations that they have or papers that they've, um, that they've either published themselves or reviews that they've uh, found through through the internet as well. Um, but essentially, they have all of these infographics that just say that essentially, you know, when you engage with FIRST, your, 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 your success in STEM um, and STEAM related activities in your future goes up significantly. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to particularly uh, belabor all of these points, but these are particular, these are uh, wonderful, wonderful things um, that they have done studies on. And it's not, this is not so much for me to convince you why to join FIRST, but these are, these are pieces of information that FIRST has, and FIRST is wonderful for having them, that you can use to, um, to talk to teachers, talk to administrators, talk to, talk to parents, the community, um, and show them why this is, an important, uh, this is an important topic, or that this is an important um, competition to take place uh, with because of the, the, the impacts and the success stories that it has associated with it. Um, another thing that I, that, you know, pretty much anyone who's, who's interested in teaching in STEM is, you know, has to keep, always keep at the back of their mind is the gender gap. Um, and FR, FRC or FIRST in general, these types of after school activities are incredibly helpful for closing that gen, uh, gender gap because there has been research on how uh, practical applications, role models and mentoring after school programs and internships 
um, are particularly helpful for engaging uh, girls both in the younger in the younger lower schools and also in the upper schools um, to to have them engaged and participate in the STEM related activities. And then finally, if you uh, look on the first website, you can see that they've done longitudinal studies that just concluded in the past year, um, where the interest or engagement of girls in uh, post secondary education has actually increased and diverged away from those not engaged in FRC and first and it's actually um, you know approaching the male counterpart in interest as well so there's a lot of very good reasons um, in context of stem and steam why to participate in first and then in general robotics uh, project-based learning and so I just wanted to give you you know a, a bunch of these uh, a bunch of these takeaway points um, without belaboring them or or getting into the details of the um, of the studies or the papers, because these are things that are amazing takeaways that you can you know you can bring to um, other other people to help you get more engagement with more uh, more students, um, peers, uh, teachers, parents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's essentially what the the general or global takeaway of why first is and FRC is very very useful um, for for education in general. Um, so I just wanted to well that's that's kind of my my first my first and and my first point um, before I move on to the specifics that is Taipei American School in Taiwan um, and first in Taiwan as well. Okay, so. Let me talk about uh, first our robotics program at TAS. Um, it started back in 2012. This is before I even joined. Uh, this is when when the, the the other lead mentor Matt Fagan was the only mentor in uh, in FRC. Um, and essentially, TAS they uh, they created a new mandate where they wanted to make robotics a more integral part of the student experience. Um, so essentially, we didn't have a computer science department or a robotics and computer science department. We we just had a couple of courses that were in computer science um, and and robotics, and uh, with no full no faculty devoted to it uh, in particular. So the the computer science robotics uh, program was created with a uh, mandate towards joining a first uh, a first team, in which we ended up or in which it was chosen that we would do um, FRC. And one of the one of the amazing things of the, our experience with FRC back then, um, so you can see our, our first robot. It's it, it it was very um, it did a lot of nothing. It was essentially a, a driving base. Um, and one of the main problems with it was actually it was made out of steel, uh, and so it was illegal when we went to competition uh, back in Hawaii, where Hawaii was our only competition, and that was a nine-hour flight away, um, which is another another challenge as well. Um, but one thing that was amazing about FIRST is they're incredibly inclu inclusory, um, where we ended up winning the Rookie All-Star Award and ended up going to Worlds. And at that point, the students ended up getting this amazing taste towards um, robotics competitions and got an immense amount of engagement um, with it because of, this, uh, because of this inclusionary principle that FIRST has in trying to bring as many students and as many teams together as possible. If it wasn't for that, we probably would not have um, done so uh, done so well in the future because of this initial initial award that we were given. Um, and so they they are very good at helping students maintain that engagement uh, through first. Um, while we while this was happening, we were also continuously improving our computer science and robotics department by uh, creating more courses for project based learning. Um, and as well as getting more machinery because of this initial this initial win that we had or this initial award that we got um, and then five years later we grew to you know to 19 classes with 21 sections and three full-time faculty and that was in 2017 and then another three years later we now have a um, a full building that is devoted to stem or steam in general um, with 18 classes and 22 sections and four full-time faculty, two part-time uh, part faculty, a secretary, and two shop techs. This is an amazing story in which um, there is this great feedback loop between, um, between students constantly pushing forward, the administration and parents seeing that, and then bringing, giving back into the school. And so there was this 
um, the cycle where you're giving back to the community, the community give, gives back to you, and there's this in, constant encouragement between between um, all all divisions of administration, students, faculty, and parents as well. Um, and it's because of this that we were able to a, achieve or or you know essentially have such amazing facilities that we're um, that we're able to enjoy right now. Um, while this was going on, we we're in our in our current uh, form, you know, we we created this graduation requirement for our school, where um, every student needs to have one semester of uh, of robotics for over their four or eight semester course in high school, um, which would mean that what every at any given time one eighth of the school should be enrolled in computer science and robotics. Um, but because of the popularity and the student interest in this in these courses. We actually have about 400 students, or half of our student body, almost um, enrolled at any given time. So this is another uh, great thing that shows you that project-based learning not only is a great educational tool, um, but it is also a great bringer. It, it brings students in, um, and they really enjoy it. And you can see there's I've I've placed a few pictures here uh, just over this past summer of how exactly um, we're able to use, we're able to utilize these, uh, these facilities where we're constantly having students build different robots um, at the same time. And, and they end up being very engaged in the process and we're creating you know, wonderful, you know, great, uh, what do you call it, um, machines or drivetrains. Um, one, one of our introductory courses is involving, it involves just building an electric, an electric go-kart essentially. Um, where students get to play around with different gear ratios and torque and such, where they 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 build a robot, they sit on it and see if they can if they if it drives, um, and then once it drives, then they figure out how can I make it go faster or how can I you know how can I do a 50 meter dash in the least amount of time uh, that sort of thing, um, and this this kind of transcends um, all the different types of students. I've seen many different types of students get very. Uh, engaged in this type of uh, in these types of projects. So, again, um, there's a lot that robotics and project-based learning, and first in general, ha can can really help um, a, a a school's curriculum as well as their their student body's education. Um, in particular, a lot of the things that we've done and a lot of things that we've learned, the way that we were able to create these projects is actually because of our experience with FIRST. The majority of the things that we're using um, to build these robots for students during their, their, their initial classes are just parts from, our old parts from FRC that we've used on previous robots in, in, in previous years. Um, and at the same time, we're, we're constantly adding and adjusting our courses to try and meet a wide variety of students uh, depending on their, their student interest. So this is essentially what, what Taipei American School is trying to, trying to do to engage as many students as possible in this type of, in this type of manner. Okay, so, um, and then finally, one of, the, one of our latest uh, endeavors um, was under the recognition that the, one of the reasons why the gender gap exists is um, females or girls tend to uh, experience or get to be more engaged when there are mentorship roles involved. And so a new course was created in which we had upper school students mentor lower school students in both FLL and FLL Junior. Um, and here's a few, you know, a few snippets of of what that course entailed. And essentially you can see there's a, um, a few upper school students over here and probably back there in which you know, student, we have lower school students constantly trying different things out. Um, and these are lower school students that would not have necessarily been engaged in robotics in the first place if it were not for this program. Um, and it's a, it's a great way of utilizing the fact that we have a whole bunch of upper school students interested in robotics while at the same time, um, we want to have more and more students engaged in the lower school for robotics so that when they do come to the upper school, they will, have, they will feel a little bit more comfortable in taking a robotics, um, robotics style course. And I, and I especially, um, I, with, with those schools that are K through 12 schools, you can utilize the fact that you have um, all grade levels to, um, to engage in this type of, in this type of, uh, this type of program. 
um, where you can have your upper school students mentoring lower school students in the off season of FRC because FLL is almost all year round. Okay, so um, so that's kind of the, the the a quick story of TAS. And if there's more questions about you know how exactly this all all formed, I'm perfectly happy on on answering them. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, Taiwan now and how FRC entered in Taiwan because it was not necessarily well, it was because uh, we engaged in FRC, but it wasn't for another four years from 2012 um, that FRC came to the rest of Taiwan. Um, and this is a, this is all starting with one student. I feel, I, ha I have a feeling that this actually happens a lot with, um, with new teams in, in various regions on, on the planet. Um, but we had, a, we had an alumni who graduated in 2017, uh, Angel Huang, in 2016, she cold called 60 different schools in Taiwan. Um, only two schools that year actually, you know, turned around and said, okay, we're, we would like to participate in FRC. Um, and, and essentially what we did that year is we ended up hosting a whole bunch of different workshops and, uh, and training sessions for these, uh, for these schools. So you can see here, this is one of the first sessions that um, the Taipei First Girls School came to TAS. And that's Angel Huang there giving the, the presentation um, of essentially what FRC is and you know what's the wh how to participate in it. Um, and it's it it it's been a long it's been a long road for them, but they are they're doing quite fantastically now. Um, in that same year, we also a whole bunch of school or a whole bunch of students got sent to their school and did a bunch of sessions with them as well. So we brought a robot there um, that we just built. Uh, they programmed it. They learned about fabrication and design. Here's a um, here's a picture of of our programmers telling them or explaining how to use uh, Eclipse back when Eclipse was used uh, for programming. Um, and and yeah, so there's there's a whole bunch of things that we did initially um, to actually kind of help you know strengthen and build that community. So at that at the time there was only two two different uh, two different teams, but it was super important. To constantly maintain that level of engagement with them, in order to um, in order to feel that camaraderie, it is it is it might be easy if you are a new team and you don't know anything, and especially there was a uh, a language barrier at the time um, to to try out one year, and then if it nothing if it doesn't work very well, and if there's no one really talking to you, it's it's very easy to just give up and say, well, let's we tried that, let's let's move on to something else. Um, the community in first is one of the one of the things that keeps the teams in and keeps that buy-in there. Um, so that's another thing that's that's important, and it seems like they that that, uh, that you all are 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 engaging that sort of thing, which is which is which sounds fantastic. Um, and then finally, later on, a few years later, um, we ended up there. We ended up getting buy-in from the government, and one of the science parks in Taiwan. Um, started kind of being the uh, the proxy for FRC a little bit in Taiwan. Now we didn't have a regional just yet, but what they did is they um, ended up helping a whole bunch of other schools. I think 21 teams at that point um, get registered for FRC, and then they held a, a session with one of their one of their large uh, one of their large studios or large labs, and our school was able to uh, go in and essentially be the be the, the group who trained all of these you know, new 20, 21 schools. Um, we had to have our entire team go there for a weekend where essentially they built um, a very rugged robot for the previous season's, uh, previous season's game. So this was in the summer of 2018. Um, and then later on in 2019, um, we were super fortunate because the, the Central Taiwan Science Park they were still pushing hard for uh, for making a, a regional because we now had a bunch of successful teams uh, start in Taiwan, and then they started going across the across the world, um, and and they also they they all enjoyed the experience, and so the Central Taiwan Science Park ended up inviting uh, the former president of First Don Bossi, who ended up coming to Taiwan and in fact to the to Taipei American School, um, which was a great uh, was a great uh, you know amount of publicity for both for Taiwan, uh, for first in Taiwan, uh, and for, for our school as well. 
Um, so these are absolutely things that, that, can, be, that can be done in, in different regions. And FIRST is very, very helpful and accommodating with, uh, with doing these, these, types of, these types of events or these types of uh, promotional, um, promotional type, type things. Um, so that's kind of what happened in the meantime between you know, the beginning of 2016 when uh, the first couple of other schools in Taiwan started their FRC teams um, to maybe about a year ago. And then in the past year, we finally, we were, we were fortunate that enough to have a regional. Unfortunately, the regional was canceled a few days before it was actually, um, it was actually hosted. But the, uh, the good thing about uh, the whole thing was that um, the, the group who was organizing the regional, they also organized an off-season event uh, six months prior. And so our school was also was, a, was able to essentially uh, volunteer as the, the team of volunteers um, for, for this, uh, this off-season event where we were able to uh, judge um, FT, FT, not FTC, um, uh, robot inspect, um, and then also help out with field management and, um, and just in general build, uh, helping with builds with, with other teams. Um, this is one thing that you're gonna see, a lot, you're gonna see a lot, especially for, for new teams, you're gonna need to give an enormous amount of, uh, of help for just in terms of like build, uh, build styles or build uh, procedures, quality, et cetera, et cetera, um, and troubleshooting. It's just even being an FRC for, for one or two years, the, the amount of uh, troubleshooting that you end up um, gaining from all of this um, is, quite to, is quite incredible. Um, and is super useful to teams that are teams that are brand new. Um, and so since then we've, you know, there was the, the off season event. Um, now because of our new building that we, that we have, we're able to regularly host training sessions uh, on a much larger scale. And we're also able to, uh, we're also able to invite teams over to help practice um, as well with their, with a, with a field, with a full field that we've, um, that we've put together. Um, and this is helpful for not just not just the other teams, but also for our own team, because we're constantly having new members come to our team, and the the experience of helping uh, fix broken robots, um, looking at how programming works for for newer teams, um, et cetera, et cetera. They are they are invaluable to all of the to all of the students, and then just even driving, practicing driving against other teams um, that might be practicing defense driving. Uh, is also great for any future um, future competitions that we happen to be in. Okay, so um, I've talked about all the, the the wonderful things that have happened with with happened with Taiwan and TAS in general. Uh, one thing that I want to mention are the challenges that we've had uh, in the past or ongoing with uh, with FRC as an international, not with FRC, but being an FRC FRC team internationally. Um, because things are not necessarily the same in Taiwan as they are in um, in the states, so I was I was struggling to um, to put a picture of a of a of a sleeping student um, in the stands because of jet lag. I, I I decided not to not to do that and spare his uh, spare his humiliation. But the jet lag is obviously one of a, a big thing. As those of you who have actually experienced been in a, a competition, um, that's the number one thing. Where other you know, uh, US-based teams don't necessarily have to deal with that as, that as much. Um, but aside from the, aside from the, you know, the, the humor that is jet lag, there's also a whole bunch of um, local problems and solutions that can come with those local problems. Um, so, for instance, we have a, um, so first off, I'm actually, I was, you know, I'm born Canadian and I was trained uh, as a physicist in Canada and Everything, everything about my upbringing is entirely metric. And then the second that I came to the school and you know, learning more and more about engineering, things became more and more imperial. And this, this, this graded on me absolutely horribly. It made me super, super angry um, because I thought that the inch was the, was the worst unit of measurement ever. Um, and, and, one of the, and so one of the issues with being in Taiwan is that no one uses inches. Um, and a bigger issue with being in Taiwan is that if you say inch improperly uh, in Mandarin, there's actually a Taiwanese inch or a Chinese inch um, that is approximate, I think it's actually exactly three centimeters. Um, so we've had a number of different problems just measuring things improperly 
because of uh, because of different units or different standards in in Taiwan. And in some cases, it's it's very funny, and in some cases, it's incredibly frustrating. Um, one one interesting experience that we've had was where we've we've tried to move our all of our aluminum or sheets of aluminum have all been in, measured in millimeters, and we've been really we've been wondering why they have strange measurements for millimeters. So there was this one particular measurement which was 6.35 millimeters and it wasn't for another like a uh, year or so that we realized that 6.5 or 6.35 millimeters is exactly a quarter of an inch that we realized that oh in fact in Taiwan they do make things in imperial sizes they just measure them in inches and it's probably because of exporting um, that they that they make imperial size type things so just measurements or units in general um, is a can be a challenge um, another challenge that we we, we run into uh, quite frequently is the um, the standards of precision um, in in Taiwan and how and how we're able to um, and there's a lot of the times that we end up ordering things that are not necessarily um, the the right or the the right size or their 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 approximation to the size is way too far off for something that we need in um, in competition. Um, because if you take a look at the, the various uh, vendors like Andymark, Bexpro, et cetera, et cetera, um, all of their, their tolerances are incredibly low for the units that they produce. Um, and so you need to be absolutely sure that all of your local, if you have local vendors, that your local vendors are able to meet that level of, or those standards that are required to interface with the legal FRC equipment. Um, so that's a that's a that's a big thing, and that can also cause a whole bunch of headaches. So keep be be aware of those um, those types of things. That being said, there is enormous amounts of advantage for being in a uh, manufacturing hub or a, a large manufacturing center uh, of the world because thing there's there's a number of a uh, number of things that are are cheaper. For instance, metal um, and some of the more basic uh, some of the more basic components that we use on our robot. Um, for for some reason, Taiwan happens to be uh, a wonderful creator of pneumatics, um, and so we end up making using a lot of pneumatics on our on our robot. But uh, these these types of things happen in, in various different countries where you can have um, different expertise or 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 whatnot. Um, we're able to make springs to various different, or we're able to have, get springs uh, to different specs as well. Um, there's a lot of advantages for us being in this particular um, this particular part of the world, um, in addition to the, some of the issues associated with it. Um, and and so, you know, that's the, these are kind of some of the um, the technical challenges just with being outside of. Um, you know the the main area that is North America, like USA and Canada, um, and so that's all just for our team for uh, for four two five three rate zero. Um, local teams have even more challenges, unfortunately, associated with their uh, with, with their with their management and and sustainability. Um, their their students have so in Taiwan, entrance exams are paramount to getting into university. And that takes up the majority of their senior year to the point that uh, seniors or their the final year of, of high school, those students don't participate uh, in FRC. And because high school is a three year um, is a three year process in, in Taiwan, um, the really there's only two years that students participate in FRC. That's twice the turnover that we have at our school. Um, to some extent, if we had students start, starting from their ninth grade going all the way to their to the 12th grade. Um, another issue is that because of this, or the universities don't necessarily recognize FRC um, as a, you know, a way of uh, boosting their scholastic ability. And so if students are doing FRC in Taiwan and in, in the local schools, it is because they like to do it. Um, there is not much of an advantage like there necessarily is in the US where US schools recognize first as a um, as kind of a, a gateway to uh, improving their their stem stem abilities um, and and so and testing right now is currently king that is actually changing um, with new curriculum that has been developed and and kind of put into you know slowly being put into place in Taiwan over the past few years 
Um, but this is a this is a slow process. And then finally, um, this is just unique to this particular year. Uh, COVID nineteen came to Taiwan earlier than uh, you know the the U S. And so it actually shut down our build season uh, pretty quickly to the point that um, the there was very minimal uh, students that were allowed on campus um, in in pretty much all of all of Taiwan. Um, there were solutions to that as well uh, that you know that that universities were allowing their their labs to be open for uh, small amounts of students to to help build the robots, um, and so that came from the fact that there is a there's a budding community in taiwan um one of the uh the major messaging platforms that exists in taiwan um is line and there are a whole bunch of line groups for different districts or different regions in taiwan um, in which parents are constantly communicating with each other essentially you, you we have different support groups that are that exist um, across various various parents or various parent groups and, and teacher groups and et cetera in different parts of Taiwan to help each other out. So even though there are a bunch of challenges, um, because of the particular uh, because of the particular culture here and of some of the technology um, that is that is used all the time here, they they have come up with solutions or the uh, a bunch of the students and the schools and the, the teachers, parents uh, have come up with solutions around this. Um, but the the takeaway from all of this, and what I want to, what I really want to emphasize across, you know, everything that I'm saying, is that you need buy-in. Buy-in is uh, paramount, and it needs to not just be buy-in from students. It needs to be buy-in from students, from parents, from teachers, uh, and from administrators. Once you have these this this buy-in, then it can start propagating into um, into local local news, and then it can start pushing um, pushing different pushing different governmental agencies. Uh, for financial support or other types of support that that uh, that you might need for especially if you wanted to to form a regional in the long term um, in your region okay um, so that's more or less the me talking about the um, how FRC uh, why F FRC is important uh, how it grew in Taipei American School uh, how it grew in Taiwan um, and now I want kind of want to talk about you know your team structure or team structure for those teams that are um, completely new or the, even those teams that have only been around for a couple of years. Um, Cause these are things that we didn't really um, learn as a team until our fourth or fifth year, um, how important it was and how to actually uh, uh, form a very strong, uh, very strong set of uh, structures. Um, we had some weak structures before, but it wasn't until a few years ago um, that those structures really started taking on a form of their own um, to the point that there's uh, it was almost impossible to to micromanage um, and that the it's essentially the students that are uh, doing the majority of this management okay so in four two five three um, the we have six different main subdivisions occasional or occasionally there's some specialist type of uh, divisions as well but this, these are the this is the the meat of our divisions um, obviously Everyone knows that mechanical uh, is important. Without mechanical, there's no robot. Um, without design, um, your robot will be a box um, that may, may or may not be able to move. Um, statistics, if you don't have statistics, you are not going to be able to um, properly, properly engage with, the, um, with other teams by knowing what their strengths and their weaknesses are. Now, being a rookie team or being a, a new team, it's a little bit, it's a little bit difficult to um, let people know that you understand their, their, their strengths and weaknesses, especially if they're a more experienced team. Um, but even when we were an ex inexperienced team, we had enormous amounts of statistics to help us with our, with our decisions and just letting us know how to uh, play the next match. So to statistics is insanely important. It also is the thing that tells you what what is the total amount of points that you can score at the beginning of your at the beginning of the whole build season. Um, logistics is essentially um, how how to get different materials, what materials you have on store, um, what you need to buy. Uh, it used to be the BOM, but it sounds like BOM is not a uh, is not a thing in the in the coming years. So. That's a, a th one less thing that the logistic person has to do, but they're also um, 
there also need to to work on um, like chairmans and outreach and all that sort of uh, sort of type of thing. Um, programming your robot doesn't move if there's no programmers. And then finally, electrical. Please don't let the programmers do the electrical. You should have uh, at least one student that is able to fully understand the entire electrical system. Um, that doesn't necessarily do too much of the other types of other types of parts because of how important um, electrical is the second that your robot breaks. Um, Okay, so what our different what our different divisions do? Um, mechanical, we have a few pre-season training pre-season training sessions uh, that the mechanical team does, um, and essentially what they do during season they make game props, they make prototypes, and then of course there's the the fabrication of the final bot and uh, and the assembly and the final assembly as well. Um, also, everything to do with repairs is is pretty much down to mechanical. Um, design there they have the worst two weeks of their lives. Um, and then they're pretty much focusing on looking at other designs um, and constantly changing the robot. The design, the design team usually makes the mechanical uh, team's life a nightmare um, by first creating the, um, by first creating, you know, by first the, the robot that they created in the first place. And then as well, they're constantly looking at new things that they, um, that they want, to, want to improve or, or want to do. Um, programming, we have, uh, we have a whole bunch of pre-season stuff that we're training for programming, as well as uh, in-season we do a bunch of autonomous and tele-op type of things. Um, we use previous year's robots to do a lot of our programming because we are quite aware of the fact that uh, mechanical and design like to keep the robot as long as they possibly can. Um, however, that does not mean um, to continue on uh, building the robot you know, forever, essentially. Um, electrical, you should, there's, we have a bunch of training for electrical as well. Um, and troubleshooting is a, a big thing that electrical always has to do. Statistics, strategy, game analysis, stats and scouting. Um, and then logistics, they, there's a lot of, you know, chairman's outreach type presentation. Off season, there's a whole bunch of uh, outreach that they, that they end up doing um, as well. Um, I was asked to, to talk uh, briefly about sustainability uh, for your team. It is, you cannot rely on the mentors to keep up to date with um, everything in, with regards to FRC um, because they, they have other things that they, they have other obligations that they have to do. Um, one thing is whatever, you know, students, I, I end up, some of our best students end up just browsing the web constantly for different types of robot designs. They're either, um, on GitHub, looking at different programming me methods, um, or Chief Delphi, looking at different people's build seasons, um, YouTube, looking at, usually it's just, you know, cheesy poofs or, um, or Robonauts, different robots from previous years, uh, Blue Alliance to take a look at different statistics and people and, uh, and what robots histories were been, have been. Discord and GrabCAD are also very useful as well um, for support and GrabCAD just in general. It's good to take a look at. Uh, other people's designs. However, I would not recommend using GrabCAD as a way of hosting your, um, your, your actual design because of how easy it is for it to completely disappear. Um, finally, I realize that I'm, I'm, I'm more or less running out of time or I'm out of it. Um, I just want to very quickly talk about um, your first first season and some of the things that you should kind of concentrate on in in terms of um, in terms of what you should do or what your team should be should be working on from the beginning of kickoff, et cetera, et cetera. So this is um, what our original plan was. Obviously, it did not take place like this whatsoever uh, during this year. But essentially, we spend about two one or two weeks of prototyping immediately after after kickoff. Uh, there's a whole bunch of meta planning where we talk about the meta game and which which direction the game we think the game is going to go into. Um, but by week two or three. We should have a fully functional bot that plays the game really, really poorly. Um, just so that A, the programmers can start programming it, B, the drive team can start practicing what on earth the game is even going to be like, and then finally, um, just so that you have something to work off of so that you know what on earth is wrong with it. Um, because your first robot that you create is not going to be good. Um, you're going to need to go through iterations at least a, a couple of times. And so you can see that a large portion of our build season is redesigning. 
Um, that CNY break that you see, that's Chinese New Year. And unfortunately, this is another challenge of being in Taiwan, where the entire country essentially shuts down, not just during Chinese New Year, but for a few days before Chinese New Year, because there's a bunch of office parties and such where um, there's, there's, really no, there's really no way of buying anything or getting anything uh, fabricated during, during that time, other than in our own, our own shop. Um, and then after our redesign, we do a final assembly and then final testing and driving, where we just spend the entire time up to our first competition uh, driving the robot, programming it, driving it, programming it, driving it, programming it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is originally our, our travel season, but that's not, not super important um, for, for the remainder of this. Okay, for build session strategies, parallel development is key. You need as many students trying out different things as possible. The, the faster you fail at things, the more you're gonna learn and the better your robot's gonna be. Um, competing ideas create the best of these ideas. The problem with competing, with competing ideas is that, especially in, in students, the, um, you end up getting more attached to these ideas. And so the successfulness of that idea does not necessarily define the, the value to, um, the, does not define the value to the team. In fact, it's the ability to implement that idea as bad as it is, is way more important and way more valued because the second that you implement it, either it'll catastrophically fail um, which means that you're just that idea is completely out, which is great to know because you never want to look at that ever again Or it only partially fails and then you know what you can do to improve it um, Very rarely is it an entire success and uh, maybe that's just us um, But we have it's very rare that our initial one initial idea is just like oh it works and it's perfect um, There are so many things that have to be iterated um, Expecting failure at every single step and having solutions at the ready is uh, is also wonderful. It also, it's a way of keeping yourself from getting discouraged and depressed when things break down, because they will always break down. Um, and also, speaking of breaking, break your robot at home. Break it as much as you possibly can, because the more you break it at home, the more you realize how it's going to break, and then it won't break at competition. Or at the very least, when it breaks at competition, um, you know how to fix it. Okay, um, so, so anyways, that's, the, that's kind of the, the extent of my talk. I've gone over by about four minutes. Um, I just want to say, say thank you to essentially um, everybody at the, the TAS administration for actually making FRC at TAS and our robotics program possible. Um, our, our head of school, Dr. Sharon Hennessy, as well as the, Hennessy, as well as the uh, TAS administration. Um, the, the Tech Cube director and 4253 lead mentor, as I mentioned earlier, Matt Fagan. Um, he's been a great help and as well as a a robotics mentor for myself as well from 20 from when I joined in 2016 onwards um, and then also you know 4253 mentor James Close who came on a couple of years ago um, has been fantastic as well and I should also uh, briefly I think one of you had communication with uh, with Daniel Liu um, earlier him and Jimmy are doing a wonderful job a bang-up job at, at leading our team this year and also our previous uh, all of our previous leaders as well as our, our students um, because they're the ones who are truly joint, who are truly driving the program. Because there's only so many uh, hours that you know the few mentors that we have can put into to any of this. Um, and so this is to me this is the biggest takeaway of students should be doing as much as possible, not just because it it looks way better to the first community, but because those are the, the those are the people who are the future and those are the the, uh, the way of getting things done in a in a reasonable amount of time essentially. Um, so yeah, hopefully there's a whole bunch of questions that I can that I can help uh, answer either about the team or about promoting uh, robotics in um, in your region or just in about first in general. Um, yes, definitely. Thank you for that very insightful conversation. I think uh, there are a lot of parallels between Taiwan and India, and you know basically how we're going to start off with our uh, you know with the regional here. So we have a couple of uh, technical questions that, as well as non-technical questions that have come in the chat. Uh, sure. First is, um, how did you get good mentorship and curriculums for the teams in these areas? Um, can can you be a bit more specific about what? I, I'm, I'm sure this came from a long a um, while ago. Yeah, can it came I, about ten minutes ago. Uh, all right, so there's one that's just come right now. Let's do that instead. Uh, all right, so how do you decide your team's aims and limits during the season? Um, so we we ended up uh, we ended up learning a lot from. Um, actually, the, one of the mentors from Robonauts did a, a session a few years ago 
um, I forget what it was what it was called, uh, but actually that was hosted by three uh, three one three two a couple of years ago. I think it was Mentors Without Borders, and essentially what we what we did is we we kind of the way that we uh, decide our aims are we we look at to to going to Einstein. Now this is because our team is a little bit more uh, a few more years of experience, um, but from a number of years ago, maybe back in twenty seventeen, we started thinking, okay what is the game going to look like on Einstein? What are the things that are gonna be necessary on Einstein? Um, and how do we build a robot that will be competitive there? And so we end up shooting you know, crazy high and a whole bunch, of, and we want the robot to do everything. And then we start taking away um, different things that are just like, okay, there's no way that that's actually going to be useful. Um, the, in terms of the number of points, our, the, the payoff is not, not helpful at all. Uh, our stats teams are incredibly helpful at driving our decision-making process. Um, and so that, that whole thought about, you know, what is going to be happening at Einstein uh, on, on the Einstein field is mostly coming from the stats, um, the stats department or the stats team. And so they end up calculating the maximum number of points. They end up calculating which types of points are going to happen for what. They approximate the number of points per second or per minute that different types of strategies are going to going to partake in. Obviously, this comes from some experience, um, but you can still roughly ballpark uh, ballpark some things as well. Um, so we have, so he actually rephrased this question a little bit. Um, all right, so how did you get good mentorship and curriculums for the teams in technical areas like programming, construction, et cetera? Okay, um, the, so, the Taipei American School, we, um, one of the things that we're, we're pretty fortunate about is that a, a lot of the hires uh, of faculty um, are, are usually, they usually have a bunch of strengths in, a bunch of, in, in various areas. So for instance, uh, both, both Matt and myself are actually, um, we're, we're both physicists. And um, Mr. Fagan or Mr. Matt Fagan, he spent a lot of time in the past doing robotics type of, uh, of work in previous schools. And he brought that to, to, to TAS or Taipei American School. Um, and so that was one of the, one of the massive successes of our, of our department and why um, the, the robots were able to be as robust as they, as they were. Um, I also happened to be there and my, my experience and my strengths uh, were in programming or my interests are in a lot of, a lot of programming um, type areas, and so that kind of developed um, alongside of uh, alongside of my my uh, what do you call it my fabrication uh, my fabrication knowledge, which was almost next to nil uh, when I first joined FRC. Um, so the we are lucky that we have a lot of faculty that are not only experienced in a bunch of different technical fields, but they're also very willing to very willing to learn and very interested. In continuing uh, continuing their their own education as well. Um, our other our other mentor uh, James Close he he's also done undergone like an enormous amount of uh, of, of exploration and growth in terms of uh, in terms of like building and and programming et cetera et cetera. Um, so it's as long as the as long as you have faculty or mentors um, that are interested that are highly interested in 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 STEM. Um, or steam with a, a, a growth mindset, then um, you're you're going to have a great you're going to have a great first uh, a great first experience or a great FRC FRC team, um, and that's essentially why how we kind of got uh, more or less the so the place we are. We're also really fortunate to have a whole bunch of students um, that just see this stuff and they get super excited about it. Um, and one of the reasons why we're learning as much as we do is because the students get engaged. So this type, type of stuff that I was talking about where, you know, students are on GitHub or on um, uh, Chief Delphi, et cetera, et cetera. These aren't necessarily things that I'm, all, that I'm always seeing. Um, and they're saying, can we try this? We should try this. We should try this. And eventually they keep asking and I, I can't say no anymore. Um, and so we ended up trying it. And then it ends up being, it ends up being wonderful. Um, so the, the students driving it, the more that they push, um, is another way of, of constantly pushing your, your, team, your team forward as well. So um, the chat has two questions, which are actually very similar to what I had in mind too. Um, and it's about creating new teams, right? So mm -hmm. how do you think, or what can be done to further attract students to these programs? 
and more importantly attract schools to force programs and perhaps increase participation so um that's a that's, that's a great question i think we we pushed really really hard for the first two teams that that entered in taiwan um and by by our our, our, our former alumni or our alumni cold calling a bunch of students um or a bunch of uh schools i mean and the the furthering of of these you know extra 21 teams or so um that were created that was a kind of a, a collaboration effort between the um the the initial school that was created or one of the school that that their frc team was uh taipei first girls school they're actually a very um a very popular and well-known school in taiwan um because of that they're they they're, they have a a large um a relatively large media presence and uh, influence as well with the the remainder of the community um and so that helps i believe that helps actually create a bunch of the a bunch of these news new teams as well as the engagement of um of the of the central of this science park that wanted to actually create a regional um one thing this is a a, a little detail that uh, I, I kind of skimmed over um there was actually with, there's a bunch of science parks in Taiwan and there was actually two science parks that were kind of competing over which one is going to be the one responsible for FRC in Taiwan. Um, and so it, it seemed like there happened to be the, all of this might have happened at the, the right place at the right time where there was a new government um, that was starting to push the idea of alternative forms of education and there was, there was probably funding there. And so the and so you had these other institutions that are like okay well let's let's see what we can do um to actually you know encourage this funding or, or use utilize this funding um and essentially what we ended up having was we had this 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 push of um of this of, of the science park of the central taiwan science park uh pushing to create these other these other teams um in conjunction with our support of being able to actually train train these teams as well because um, unfortunately they knew nothing about first at the time or nothing about frc and so there was a lot of collaboration between us and so we were incredibly fortunate for the you know a, a few of these events to to actually happen now that being said um it would not hurt to to help get um some type of media exposure um in in some type of local maybe a local paper or whatnot. This is something that we're actually trying to uh, achieve as well, in order to make universities be more rec uh, cognizant of FRC in Taiwan, because the thing that is motivating students in Taiwan is not necessarily so. In, in the states, university is crazy expensive, um, and FR, uh, first and FRC has a bunch of scholarships associated with these uh, with with students in the states. That's not a problem in Taiwan because the university tuition is not that expensive. Um, but what is a problem is acceptance into these colleges or into these universities and how are you going to make these universities start to understand that FRC or FIRST in general is um, going to actually improve their, the, their students because essentially what's, what universities want is they want students who graduate and go on to what they consider successful careers. Um, and so if they are convinced that FRC is actually a, um, a a step towards that then then that can be a you know that, that can be kind of a, a this feedback loop where more and more um, university might want to take part in at the very least supporting this type of thing um, that being said also you know industries as well um, is a is a great start to to help support both financially and then to have um, alumni or first alumni work in these particular uh, these particular um industries or, or companies now that in in your case that's that's still another four four or five years away because of um the newness of the teams but that is certainly a certainly an avenue that you can explore as well so um there was actually a very interesting one that came in the chat and i think will be really helpful for all the rookie team members that are you know on this call today and that is uh, how do you suggest new team members to choose sub teams that they would like to be part of you know, like mechanical programming, design, statistics, etc. So, what kind of advice would you have for these people? Because I know for a fact there are a lot of them here that are still confused. Right. They, this is this is something that we we 
we always we always struggle with every year as well. Um, we just pretty much tell students to sign up for everything that they're remotely interested in. Um, students are very good at self-selecting. So they'll try a few things out and then they'll realize, well, this is not for me. Um, or that I, I've just driven myself crazy with CAD. I don't ever want to touch that ever again. And then they move on to uh, mechanical. Or I've had students that, you know, are very good at programming and they absolutely hated CAD. And then also vice versa as well. That being said, that doesn't necessarily fix that student in that mindset for that uh, for the remainder of their time in FRC. We've had students transfer between different um, uh, different sections throughout the the course of their four years at uh, in in four two five three or in RAID zero. Um, one thing that I've I've found kind of interesting is that like all of our a bunch of our design and mechanical heads uh, that have gone on to graduate are now all in computer science. Um, they hated programming when they were in, in FRC. They thought that it was just some strange magical voodoo and would blame the programmers whenever something went wrong. Um, but, the, but ultimately they ended up finding that programming was actually the thing that they were most interested in when they went into, uh, when they went into college. So especially when the, the, young, the young adult brain is still developing, things become more easy or less easy over time. And, um, and so they don't necessarily have to fix themselves into a role. One thing is one of our best programmers that was he was through was in our team for four years. Um, it turns out that he was not super, he was not super fond of it and that he much preferred being, uh, being a, a designer. He came back and mentored for us and was an amazing, uh, amazing designer. He was still a great programmer, but he moved on to a different, um, a different field as well. So um, they should, students should just be trying different things out because you know, the, you're not even in you're not even in college yet, so there's no reason to to kind of fix yourself into one particular um, one particular division. So you've taught math and physics classes, right? Apart mm -hmm. from the robotics and computer science courses. So what yeah. do you think are the key differences in terms of how students grow um, when it comes to their learning curve, when it comes to um, their logical reasoning skills? What changes do you see? Um, that robotics can make, be it first or be it um, the, the school curriculum courses? So that's, that's an amazing question. It's, I find it's, it's, a, it's a little bit random when it actually happens. Um, the, the types of growth that you see are, it's, it's almost like a, a step function where um, students are kind of like, they're, they're, they're moving on, they're going through the, the motions, and then all of a sudden something about the, whatever they happen to be working on just clicks with them and it all of a sudden makes sense and then they 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 jump up and then it becomes a completely brand new world to them um and it happens at different stages and there's different types of projects now as a teacher you have to find the you have to you know help the student explore what the right what the right project is sometimes that involves uh forcing them to to do the research themselves sometimes that requires you going along with the research uh, with them at the same time. Um, one one particular fun funny uh, funny story I have from actually the same the same student who started the the two teams in Taiwan. Um, I taught her uh, math uh, calculus in the past, and um, she really did not like calculus, at least the the calculus that I taught her at the time, um, and. She, she expressed that, she, that that Taylor series didn't make any sense to her whatsoever. Um, and it wasn't until the second year or her, her senior year that we started talking about springs and, and deformations of different objects in, on, on a robot uh, that, you, that she understood or she was asking, the, she asked the question, why on earth can everything be approximated as a spring um, to the lowest order? And then the, the word Taylor series just kind of popped, in, popped out and she, and it kind of blew her mind at that point, where um, all of a sudden this this particular um, idea that she saw in robotics um, connected a whole branch of mathematics to her that she thought was completely useless and completely irrelevant to pretty much anything. It was just a just happened to be a um, an exercise, a, a mental exercise. Um, a lot of students, especially in high school, I also remember this myself when I was in high school. A lot of math and physics really feels like just, just exercises for the sake of doing exercises. Um, and it's not until you actually start seeing things moving or seeing the interactions between different objects um, that, you, that you start to recognize the reasoning 
for um, for a bunch of these these exercises that you that you do. Um, one of the things I really like are, are linkages that we that we use all the time in robotics because they're a great way of teaching geometry to pretty much anybody um, at, at various at various levels because of you know different different theorems and uh, triangle theorems or quadrilaterals and whatnot. Um, so yeah, that's 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 kind of my my take on take on the whole thing. So uh, that's I mean we just have one last question because I know we're a little overboard the time. But this is you know, something very important to all of us because we have a lot of new members. Uh, yep. So it's come in. How do, you, how do new members practice things like uh, mechanical, electrical components when we're working from home right now and they don't have physical access to these resources? That's a, that, that is a wonderful question that I think I need to, I actually have to, to figure out myself before school starts um, in, in the case of, of, us, of, of us having to work from home. Um, so mechanical mechanical it really depends on what you mean by mechanical if if by mechanical you mean like how to uh, how to tighten a bolt um I, I i have a hard i have a hard time figuring something like that out other than sending them a couple of bolts and and nuts and and you know pieces with holes in them and then telling them to fasten them together um and make sure that they that it's the right amount of tightness that it doesn't turn but it, you also haven't stripped the strip the bolt um because essentially a student's going to have to maybe strip and cross thread a bolt maybe 400 times before uh, they don't do that ever again. I'm still at like num time number 200 or so because I'm still stripping and, 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 uh, and cross threading bolts myself. Um, but if you're talking about just general fabrication principles and design, uh, when we went to e-learning um, or online learning back in February, uh, a large portion of my, of my teaching was using, uh, using SOLIDWORKS. And this is actually a great uh, opportunity for um, especially FRC teams because SOLIDWORKS is free um, to any FRC team. Uh, and you can basically ask for as many licenses as you need for your, uh, for your team and just give them a bunch of different tasks to, uh, to do. Some things that becomes a little bit simpler and then harder and harder and harder over time. Um, I developed a few, a few very quick YouTube videos um, on, on linkages, um, on, on gearboxes, uh, et cetera, um, in, in how to create these things in, in SOLIDWORKS. Electrical, on the other hand, is a little, bit, um, a little bit harder. There are programs online that you can use. You know, they, there's these Arduino programs where you can plug in different wires into different ports on an Arduino or on like a breadboard or something and see if you're like, if you shorted the circuit or not. Uh, but I don't necessarily think that, they're, that they, they don't give you that tactile feedback of, of like blowing up a light, for instance, that you get to do with an Arduino um, that I've done many times and I've had students do many times over and over again. Um, so the, those, might be, those might be a little bit hard. That being said, they're like jumper wires and, our, and, and, and uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, LEDs, they're, they're crazy, crazy cheap. So it's not, it may not be too difficult and, and I, I can be completely wrong. Um, to to create like small small little care packages of um, of like just some uh, like basic uh, basic lights or basic LEDs a breadboard and, and some and some jumper wires uh, for instance now as it comes to like FRC type of things um, that's a little bit harder now giving them giving a giving your electrical head all of the components of an FRC electrical system and say make this um, that's a great exercise because you give them a battery and then you give them all the electrical components and tell them to make it. Don't give them the Roborio because that's expensive and you don't want to blow it out. Um, but most of these other things, they will not, they will not break um, if you wire it backwards or if you, if you wire it wrong. So that's a, we, we've actually done that. That's been our major training for all of our electrical heads or our electrical uh, students by just telling them, here's the getting started with FRC guide. Here's a bunch of electrical components, make it. Um, and then they may or may not, and then we, they come back with a problem, and then you, you help them sort, sort through it, and then they go back again. Um, and you give them a multimeter and teach them how to, how to troubleshoot with a multimeter. That's insanely useful as well. Um, and and they, be, they come back, and they, become, they come back really, really great at it. Now, wire management is another story um, that is, is very difficult to, to teach remotely. Um, but that's that that's that's another that's kind of another another topic for another day, I think.
Thank you for your response. I think that wraps it up for today's session. And we've already gone um, past the time we'd set for this to end. So on behalf of Team Elevate, I'd like to extend a vote of thanks to Dr. Allen for his enlightening talk. You told us about how you've integrated robotics so wholly into your school curriculum. And I think it's honestly revolutionary and extremely thought provoking as to how we could initiate something similar. Um, and also your talk was surprised, extremely comprehensive, right? I'd attribute the paucity of questions during the actual presentation to how thorough you were. And I honestly can't express how grateful we are to have someone like you convey your ideas and really educate us about the possibilities when it comes to the STEM and FIRST communities. So thank you, Dr. Allen. Well, you're absolutely welcome. It's been, uh, I'm, I'm super honored to even be able to, to, to talk to all of you about this. Um, and really, um, I, I, I briefly saw Luann's talk from, uh, from Saturday and I, let me express the exact same thing. If there's anything that you guys, uh, that all of you need um, in terms of help or, or guidance or, or just in general to, to chat about some, some basic things and troubles that you, that you all have, please, please uh, you know, continue to, to reach out to us. It's, it's, it's all of our goals to, to kind of spread this as much as possible um, and to reach as many students and, uh, and, and to educate. Um, as and bring STEM to you know as, as many as possible that we that we can. So, again, thank you so much for 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 this opportunity, and I'm I'm glad that I was able to I was able to help all of uh, you know some of you, and I I've definitely again with my my last slide. Good luck to all of you. Um, hopefully, there's still a there's a season next year, but uh, even if there's even if there's not, there's still lots of projects and different things that you can that you can work on. Um, either at home or in small groups or, or whatnot, depending on the situation that, that that is six or six or eight months from now. Alan, thank you so much. You've been super helpful and super insightful. Manan really said, uh, summarized it very well when he said that, you know, the talk gave us insights into various things, especially as we are a team which is looking at, uh, you know, getting a first regional to India. So, yeah, I mean, uh, and also the whole interaction that I've had, you know, with you during uh, getting you here has been amazing. So I do hope that we can continue to kind of interact and uh, see how we can collaborate and uh, learn so much from you. Uh, we also are a school team. So there, there are a lot of similarities that we have and there are so many lessons to learn. So I, okay. I'm sure we can touch, back, touch base and again, you know, uh, circle back with you and then see how we can uh, take it forward. That would be that'd be fantastic. That's 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 awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. No problem. Bye. All right. Uh, thank you everyone for joining in, and uh, please come back uh, tomorrow for some more exciting talks. <laughs>